All right, welcome back. Let's talk about some more in situ meteorological uh, instruments. Um, how about thermometers and ways of measuring temperature? Well, the one you're certainly most familiar with is a so-called liquid in glass thermometer. And the, really, the theory behind them is pretty basic. You got some liquid inside of there. It might be mercury. It might be alcohol. Um, that red stuff that's inside some thermometers, that's a, that's a type of alcohol. Mercury, of course, is a liquid metal that's extremely toxic. There are pros and cons to using mercury, and there are pros and cons to using alcohol in your thermometer. There's a few other liquids that can be in there. But the basic design is pretty straightforward. A relatively large amount of the liquid is stored in a reservoir down in the bottom down there called the bulb of the, th the thermometer. And then as that liquid expands or contracts in response to changes in the temperature around the thermometer, it moves up and down that stem of the thermometer. There's a small channel inside there, a small uh, tube, if you will, inside of the thermometer itself, and the mercury will expand or contract and it will move up and down there. That channel is actually very, very, very tiny. It might look big when you look at a thermometer, but that's because the shape of the uh, thermometer stem, the glass stem itself, works as kind of like a magnifying glass that makes you see that the, 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 the column of mercury or the column of that alcohol moving up. But if you actually look at that schematic diagram there, it is extremely thin. In fact, the word for that thin column of mercury or that thin column of alcohol that's moving up that, uh, the, the stem of the thermometer is called the liquid thread. And I mean, it is a thread. It is very, very thin. And that actually is very smart because the actual changes in volume of the alcohol or the mercury in response to temperature are really not all that big. So you have a relatively large reservoir of the liquid down there in the bulb, and it, a small expansion in terms of change in volume will push that mercury quite a bit up that very thin, um, you know, that liquid thread of the thermometer. Um, you know, an observable amount. I mean, the actual change in volume of the mercury over like a one degree Celsius change is very, very small. But it'll be, a, because that thread is so narrow, it'll actually push the thread up the, uh, up the stem a noticeable amount. I think it's interesting too to notice that uh, the glass around the bulb is very thin compared to the glass around the liquid thread. The, th the glass around the bulb is thin so that Changes in the temperature around the thermometer are quickly conducted into the liquid inside of the bulb. If the glass was thick around the bulb, the response time of your thermometer would be terrible. It would take a long time for the heat around the bulb to be reflected as to what's going on in the temperature inside the bulb. Why, is it, why do they use thicker glass around the, the, on the stem of the thermometer? Because it would be ludicrously fragile if they didn't. Okay, plus they like the fact that this thicker glass around the liquid thread acts as a magnifying glass. And liquid and glass thermometers work great. They can be calibrated to be incredibly accurate and incredibly precise, but they need a person, they need an observer there to read them. This is something that's actually quite hard to automate. There are apparatuses that can read a liquid and glass thermometer, maybe optically, like a camera is taking a picture of where the mercury is, but in general, they are surprisingly difficult to, to automate. By and large, they work best in a situation where an observer is going to be there taking, you know, going out and reading that thermometer. If you want it to be more automated or at an unmanned site, or a piece of equipment that will be on a weather balloon where there is no person or up on a mast or something, you're going to want to use a piece of electronics. And there certainly are a number of different names for the instrument that would be used, but they're all based on a thermistor. A thermistor is a little electronical, electronic, uh, electrical component that you can buy it in the back of Radio Shack for like 20 cents or something like that. And the re electrical resistance across the thermistor is, very, is a very strong function of temperature. Uh, so, again, there are pieces of electronics that can measure the re electrical resistance of an element. And in this case, you will measure the resistance across this thermistor. And from that, you can fairly easily compute the temperature. And this is how weather balloons and, and uh, uh, meteorological mass do it. Uh, any kind of sensor, I got a thermometer right here. <clears throat> Now this electronic thing here, it's doing it with a thermistor. There's a little thermistor in here measuring the temperature right now. There's a little handheld um, weather instrument that's called a Kestrel uh, that is measuring the temperature there in that slide right there. 
A well-calibrated thermistor was a cheap and reliable way to measure temperature. This is a this is a brilliant little piece of technology. It's also very easy to convert to digital information to be stored by your data logger or whatever. No sweat. The problem is maintaining absolute calibration. It turns out neither thermistors nor thermometers are really all that good at maintaining their their uh, absolute calibration when they're out in the field under changing conditions. Um, this is actually a, a challenge. If you have, I mean, if your thermometer gives a particular temperature right now, and an hour from now it gives a different temperature, the change in the temperature, you know, that's no problem. But the absolute calibration is actually surprisingly hard to maintain. If you've got somebody out there who can calibrate the thing routinely, you know, by, um, you know, they, they put it in an ice water bath and they know the temperature of that bath is zero degrees Celsius and they can calibrate the thermometer to that, great! But that's, that's trouble. Also, neither uh, glass in, uh, liquid and glass thermometers nor thermistors are particularly precise. Um, be, at least not the ones that are going to be purchased for like meteorological purposes. And that's a real problem because there are a number of important meteorological calculations that are about the difference in temperature between two nearby sites. Like on a meteorological mast, it's often the case that at like 10 meter intervals along the mast, you're going to be measuring the temperature. I just measured two temperatures along the way. I'm going to call it T1 and T2. And like the difference between temperature 1 and temperature 2 is going to be an important number in determining things like the rate of conduction of heat from the Earth's surface and things like that. Important things that meteorologists need to know. But if you don't really have your temperatures all that well calibrated on these two here at these two different heights, how are you going to know that the temperature difference between them means anything? That's actually a really important and ch difficult challenge in meteorology. It turns out there are a, there's a different technology of electronic equipment called thermocouples that are specifically designed for measuring temperature differences. And I don't want to get down into that too much because that's a whole word that we use awkwardly in English anyway. Um, meat thermometers always talk about the quality of their thermocouple and the ther thermostat in your house talks about the quality of the thermocouple and that's a different use of the word and let's just not go there okay but I just wanted you to be aware that there is this challenge here I'm, sometimes the difference between the temperature at two locations is the problem is what you need and all thermometers have that challenge it's very difficult to measure to keep them that accurately calibrated um, let's talk about instruments that measure humidity um, in general, as a group of instruments, the right word for measure, instruments that measure humidity are hygrist, I'm sorry, hygrometers. Uh, that being said, within the world of hygrometers, there's going to be all kinds of psychrometers and hygristers and things like that, slightly different words for the different technologies that are used to measure humidity. Um, humidity itself is not going to be directly related to power production uh, and wind all that accurately. I mean, there is some relation. You might remember that the flux of kinetic energy through your wind turbine depended on the density of the air. Humidity actually does have a strong influence on the density of the air, so I guess in that regard it does. But by and large, this would be more part of just routine weather observation. Now, we're going to talk about three different types of hygrometers in today's lecture. There's going to be sling psychrometers, chilled mirrors, and hygristers. And these are three very common technologies that are used to measure the amount of moisture that's in the air. So here's a picture of a nice example of a sling psychrometer. A sling psychrometer is a handheld instrument that has two thermometers mounted onto like a little handle, and you're going to swing them around uh, I guess I couldn't find my example of a sling psychrometer. Um, one, one of the two thermometers is just an ordinary thermometer. There is a bulb, th regular just liquid and glass thermometer that we're going to be measuring we're gonna, the, the air temperature. We're going to call that the dry bulb temperature. And the reason why we call it the dry bulb is the other bulb is going to be wet. There's sort of a little cotton sock that you slip over the other thermometer. Uh, meteorologists always call that the footy, like what baby jammies have. Uh, they have the footies. And you get that sock wet. When you swing the sling psychrometer around, air flowing over that, that wet footy causes evaporation and cooling. And so the wet bulb will be measuring a different temperature than the dry bulb does. Uh, the wet bulb temperature is called TW, and the dry bulb temperature was just T. And Well, given T and TW, it's actually possible to compute any of the many possible ways of describing the amount of water vapor that's in the atmosphere. Uh, we won't go into all the details of all how that's all done, but once you have those two pieces of thermodynamic information, it's not a terribly difficult thing to do. 
Um, on the other hand, it sort of it requires labor. I mean, somebody has to swing this thing around. There are implementations of a similar sort of idea that can be set up to run automatically in something like a like an instrument shelter and so on. Uh, there can be uh, psychrometers that work in the same sort of principle where like a fan blows across them instead of them being swung around. Um, but they're a difficult instrument to run in an automated sense. They're a difficult instrument to... Um, to to to, uh, to digitize and so on. Um, it's just a very manual way of, of of producing observations of humidity. And so instead, we're going to try some other technologies here. And probably the best one is the uh, best example. Of one is a chilled mirror hygrometer. Now I wish I had a good picture of a chilled mirror hygrometer to show you, but the truth of the matter is, if you just go online and look at them, they look like. You know, they're just a box. I mean, there's you don't really see... They're just boxes with some louvers and stuff on it and dials on the front. They don't look like anything. Um, but the idea behind a chilled mirror hygrometer is they exploit the fact that the temperature at which water vapor begins to condense out of the atmosphere is a function of the humidity. When... What we do here is there's sort of a mirror that there is a light that is being shined onto this mirror, and then there's some kind of photo, detec photo detector that is measuring the light that's being reflected off of that mirror. In this particular case, they have a little lens and so on helping and so on. But what they'll do is then the equipment will chill the mirror. And as the mirror chills down below the ambient temperature, eventually it will reach a temperature that it's the dew point temperature, to use the term for meteorology, it'll reach a temp the mirror will reach a temperature at which condensation forms on the mirror and the mirror will fog. See, I drew some, I don't know, some blobs of water there on the mirror. And the mirror will no longer be so good at reflecting the light that's being emitted by that little LED there. And so the photo detector will notice a sudden drop in the amount of light that it's picking up because the mirror has fogged over. That's pretty slick. Now, if the air is very humid, you don't actually have to cool the mirror all that much before it fogs over. In other words, the dew point temperature is not all that much lower than the air temperature. On the other hand, if the air is very dry, you may have to cool that mirror a lot before you start getting condensation on it. In other words, the dew point temperature might be a whole lot lower than the air temperature. And this property, the dew point temperature, is actually one of the most fundamental quantities in an atmospheric science context. I mean, once you have this measured, there's all kinds of important calculations and forecasts and stuff you can produce using that information. So do, uh, chilled mirror it's like uh, the hygrometers are pretty slick. Uh, they too, though, are kind of a fussy technical piece of equipment that requires calibration and maintenance and so on. An even simpler, although less accurate technology is just to use a piece of electronic equipment called a hygrister. And again, a hygrister is just a cheap little thing that you can solder on to a wire uh, that you can buy a hygrister in the back room at, at uh, Radio Shack for a couple pennies. I mean, they're just a cheap little piece of equipment there. And all they are is just a little piece of electrical equipment who has an, an electrical resistance across it that's just a function of the humidity that the equipment is being exposed to. So once again, this is something, there are standard ways to measure the electrical resistance across a component. And so this becomes like a piece of the equipment inside of like a handheld weather sensor. Or later when we learn about weather balloons and the equipment they carry. I mean, this is just a cheap, expendable little piece of equipment that um, can provide reasonably good measurements of the moisture. Th th there are lots of problems with hygristers. They are certainly the weak link of these moisture uh, hygristers. They, they are definitely the weak link of all the instruments that we have here in terms of moisture measurement. But a well-calibrated hygrister is certainly cheap and can provide a fairly reliable way to measure the humidity in the air. It's certainly very easy to convert its inf output into digital information, get it logged into a data logger, and so on. I mean, this is standard stuff. Okay, well, setting aside mo um, the moisture measurements that we're getting from hygrometers, let's switch real quick to barometers. Barometers, of course, as we've mentioned before in this class, measure the pressure of the air. And broadly speaking, there's two types of barometers. There, air, there are mercury barometers and there are anem aneroid, or aneroid barometers. Excuse me there. Uh, this is a fairly typical example of what you'll see as a schematic diagram of to how a mercury barometer works, where there's sort of a little puddle of mercury in a in a open container, and then there's sort of like a tube suspended in it with a little vacuum at the top, and the mercury will climb the tube on the inside in, in a, to an extent that is reflected by the pressure of the air pushing down on the mercury. 
Um, this is actually, of course, well, as we discussed before, this is actually measuring the total pressure. If you want this to be the static pressure, which is the meteorologically useful uh, measure of pressure, you have to make sure you're doing this out of the wind. Um, so, I mean, the actual principle is very simple. Uh, what, what, Torcelli, Torricelli, something like that, invented this. Evangelista Torcelli, that's her name, his name, uh, was an Italian who invented this back, uh, like, the 1700s. His uh, used wine instead of mercury. Uh, mercury works better because mercury is so dense that the, the tube only has to be like 30 inches tall for the mercury to climb to its new equilibrium height. Uh, the the uh, the wine barometer that Torcelli built uh, was over 35 feet tall. Um, they are uh, kind of a fussy little piece of equipment here that's really just measuring the total pressure as we talked before. We have to keep it out of the wind if we're going to have any success. Now, this thing is actually pretty hard to automate. Um, it's a fussy piece of equipment that involves a whole bunch of calibrations in, in here that are detailed. You have to correct for the facts, for example, that the mercury expands and contracts with the temperature. So there's corrections you apply to that. There's actually, once when you bring a barometer to a new location, there are corrections you have to do based on the latitude of the Earth uh, that corrects for local variations in gravity and so on. Um, there's actually several different fine points of adjustment that like a theory of instruments class would have to teach you about how to make this thing actually work to adjust for the fact that mercury forms a little meniscus or kind of a dome shape. There's all kinds of problems in these things as to how to handle it. Not to mention, it's mercury. It's a dangerous material in a fragile container. When I was a graduate student at Purdue, I'll tell you a story. When I was a graduate student at Purdue, behind a glass cabinet door, we had a mercury barometer that was like this. I mean, it was just a demonstration. It had a dish of mercury and a glass tube and so on. And one night, the maintenance staff decided to clean that cabinet. And they had no idea what that thing was. It just looked like a big metal rod sitting in a, on a metal stand. And they picked it up and sploosh! Mercury went everywhere, right? It's, it's, it's mercury is very slippery liquid metal. And the men in the paper suits have to come and clean the building. We were out of the building for a couple days while they got... I mean, this wasn't a small mercury... Dr you you got to call the guys in the paper suits if you spill a couple drops of mercury. You spill this whole container of mercury, you're out of the building for a while. Anyway, now, in practice, real mercury barometers don't look very much at all like that demonstration that they have over there. Um... Uh, the um, the Creighton Zap, uh, Science Building doesn't have their barometer up anymore just because, you know, there's no atmospheric science anymore. Um, but they, they're, they're usually kind of mounted on the wall, usually with some kind of housing around it to keep people from touching it. And that little dish of mercury at the bottom is actually only like a couple drops of mercury. And that little tube that it gets pushed up, it's kind of like the... Um, like the stem of a thermometer or something. I mean, it's narrow. They're trying to minimize the amount of this very dangerous material uh, that's in here so that they're easier to work with and safer and so on. They don't actually look physically very much like the picture on the left there. All right. To avoid... Obviously, a mercury barometer is not the right tool for a lot of jobs. I mean, if you need to measure the pressure on a, as a weather balloon flies away, that is not the right tool for the job, right? I mean, you do not want a mercury barometer carrying any amount of mercury to, like, fly away in a balloon and crash back to the earth and all that kind of stuff. You're going to want to work with something much simpler and safer, like an aneroid barometer. Aneroid is a weird word. Um, aneroid means something like dry. Okay, there's no liquid involved. And aneroid barometers have a very simple principle, too. They're basically a series of sealed cells. They're like little, little canisters that are partially evacuated to a, you know, they're calibrated as to how much air they pumped out of them. And then, based on the air pressure around them, the air will either slightly crush the cans or slightly allow the cans to expand back out. You kind of can see that in that picture right there, where those three little canisters are stretching out or getting crushed depending on how much air pressure is on them. And then the whole apparatus is sort of hooked up over as, uh, through some little um, mechanical mechanisms to like a needle that then, you know, shows on a gauge after calibration how much pressure there is in the air. It's a relatively simple experiment. Um, in a, like, basic science class or an introduction to meteorology class, sometimes we make these uh, using, um, like, a baby food jar with, uh, like, a rubber balloon on the top or something to kind of watch how that rubber balloon expands and contracts uh, based on air pressure. This is a fairly straightforward technology, and it's pretty simple to just rig something like this up to, like, what we call a barograph, where the needle is, in fact, applying ink to a piece of paper that's rotating on a very slow, you know, on a very slow gimbal there, 
uh, so that, uh, is gimbal the right word? Uh, where as it turns, it writes on there, uh, you know, it's leaving a mark showing what the pressure was at any given time. Simple little technologies like that. It's very easy to digitize the information that's coming from these aneroid barometers. They're ridiculously cheap. I mean, the little ones that they manufacture for um, use in like a weather balloon are only pennies to manufacture them. I mean, there's just very little to them. They're a cheap and easy technology for getting observations of the pressure. Now, before we move on to the next part of the lecture, let's go ahead and ask a couple quick questions here. Question seven. In a liquid and gla glass thermometer, the liquid thread is extremely narrow, blank. A, so that the temperature changes outside of the stem of the thermometer are easily conducted into the liquid thread. B, to maintain the structural integrity of the thermometer. Or C, so that small changes in the volume of the liquid in the bulb change the height of the liquid thread noticeably. Which of those three answers is the best explanation as to why the liquid thread is so narrow in the stem of a thermometer? All right, make a choice of those three options and get a little feedback before you move on to question eight. 